All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad all of you could join us today for today's session. My name is Ryan Crow. I'm an advanced certified nonprofit professional, and I am a member of the Association of CNPs Executive Committee. Today's, today's session is brought to you by the Association of CNPs, the professional organization of CNPs. One way the association supports its members is by hosting sessions on topics that are on the minds of nonprofit professionals and CNP learners. For today's session, we're hosting Chad Barger, a fellow AC, advanced certified nonprofit professional. Chad is a master fundraising trainer. I can't wait to hear how to better work with our boards. Welcome and thank you very much, Chad. Take it away. Great, thank you, Ryan. Uh, thank you, Keely and the team. Um, great to be with you all today um, and really excited. Um, I've been a uh, CNP since uh, college, and that's getting to be too many years ago now. So that's uh, over 20. Um, and uh, when they came out with the ACNP, I uh, was, was happy to be uh, one of the first folks there and um, excited and glad you all are, are in community as well. So there we go. We are spotlighted for me and I'm going to hop into the slides and just get right into it. I have um, this hour kind of jam packed with information on this uh, problem that many of us run into with how to get your board to fundraise. And um, it doesn't matter what I'm presenting on. Um, at the end of the session, there's going to be a hand and I'm going to get two questions. The first one is, which fundraising database should I use? Because um, we're all confused there and nobody's happy. And the second one is, how do I get my board to actually raise some money? Um, all the time. It's the number one complaint I get from nonprofit executive directors. Chat, no matter how often I ask, my board won't fundraise. And I actually take issue with one word here, and that word is won't. Because I find that it's not that they will not fundraise, it's that something's missing. It's one, two, or three things are actually missing. And those are what we're gonna focus our time here of how can we address those? I'm gonna give you practical tools to try to meet some of those needs. Because it's not that they will not fundraise, it's that we need to provide a little more expertise and things to help them. Well, hopefully your board does not look like this, um, but uh, we're gonna try. I, I use this slide in several presentations. I always say that the only thing really going well here is that they're really well hydrated. I don't know why they have that much water, but nobody wants to be there. You know, we're doing reports at meetings. So we're gonna give you some tools to try to create a stronger board meeting as well. So um, the game plan, uh, talk about that real problem. What are those three things that we're lacking? And then I'm gonna give you 12 tips to get your board to fundraise. Um, I always provide additional resources and we should have some time for questions and comments at the end. Um, I'll stick around. Feel free to use the chat feature um, and you can do it as we go along. Occasionally I'll take a question on the fly if it ties in really well. But I think we are ready. Oh, first off, a little bit more, who am I? Um, Ryan told you a little bit about me. I'm not gonna go into it. You can read my bio page if you want, but I'm a career long fundraiser. It's all I've ever done. Serve the top three organizations as a frontline fundraiser. I am a CFRE, a certified fundraising executive, an advanced CNP, a master trainer with the association. And these days I spend my time with my own firm, Productive Fundraising, providing fundraising training and coaching to small to mid-sized nonprofits. And I have the honor of serving on the faculty at Temple University and Messiah University as an adjunct teaching their fundraising courses. Where do I hail to you from? I'm from where they make your chocolate bars. So um, I live in central Pennsylvania, just outside of Hershey. And uh, my question when I do this is, why do they make your chocolate bars in Hershey, Pennsylvania? Throw it in the chat if you know why they make chocolate in Hershey, Pennsylvania. We do not have cacao plants. It is not tropical. There's melting snow outside. Any takers? It's not too hot. No. Cows. We have lots of cows. It's uh, Hershey's milk chocolate. We live just outside of uh, Lancaster County, the uh, Amish area with tons of milk. And um, that is there. Come visit. We have a fabulous amusement park. You can take a theme park ride where cows will sing to you and teach you how to make chocolate. All right. 
we are done. Um, I've seen it in the chat already. So um, Kaylee and team will definitely send you some materials. I have materials for you as well. Um, Productivefundraising.com slash resources is where everything I have for you lives. And I just threw that link in the chat. Um, so feel free. I always recommend click the link in the chat so it's up in your browser and then come back to me and uh, you'll be all set and ready to go. Um, I think we're ready. What's the real problem? What's the real problem? Real problem is one, two, or three things. A lack of clarity, a lack of knowledge, and or a lack of motivation. So clarity. They're just not really sure what their fundraising role is because we have a vague line in their job description that says assist with fundraising. Uh, we're not specific enough. Knowledge. We assume that because they've been on other boards, they know how to fundraise, but maybe they've never actually really had to do it. And motivation. You know, they know what they're supposed to do, they know how to do it, but they're just really not motivated because they're kind of distanced from the mission and we're not really doing what we need to to, to kind of spur that action. So um, those are our challenges. Uh, what are we going to do about it? That's where we're going. 12 tips to get your board to fundraise. Um, the first two do not directly represent clarity, knowledge, or motivation, but they make everything else we're gonna do a lot easier. So first one, get the right mix of board members for your organization. This certainly helps with everything, but it definitely helps with fundraising engagement as well. Um, so I like to think about, you know, getting the right people on the bus, and I'm a child of the late 80s, early 90s, so this takes me back to, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood and the trolley and all of that, so I love this slide. But um, the right people on the bus and the right people for your bus, you know? What does that look like? Who do we need to get on our board? So often when it's time to recruit new board members, what do we do? We go to our board or maybe our governance committee and we say, you know, we're gonna have three board openings it looks like in March. Um, who do we know that would be good? Who do we know that'd be good for the board? And what do they say? They say, oh, well, my friend, uh, you know, Barb has been on the boards before. Maybe she'd be interested. And everybody suggests people that they already know. And who do we know? We tend to know people that are a lot like us. And that's how we end up with these homogeneous boards of all the same people, um, similar expertise, similar age, similar ethnicity, similar gender, all these things because it's just, who do you know? And we don't kind of take a first step of looking at the needs. I saw it uh, come in the chat, like, how do you define that? How do we figure that out? And that takes me to my first tool for all of you, which is a board composition matrix, all right? Board composition matrix. So what does this look like? My apologies, it's small, but I have it for you on the resources page to grab. Uh, it's a spreadsheet. And going across the top columns are all your current directors. You just put them in there. And then going down in the rows are all of the things that are important to your organization. Um, so we have diversity things in here. We have experience. We have skill sets. So you can see gender, ethnicity, estimated age. I highly recommend you do estimated since you're guessing. Um, residents, you know, maybe we have a wide service area, so we need representation from different areas. Experience, number of years on the board. And then down there, it gets to applicable expertise. So we rank our current board, and then this tool shows us the gaps. So instead of saying, we are going to need a few new board members, who do you all know? You say, we need a few new board members. Based on our board composition matrix, it looks like we could really use a few uh, females of non-Caucasian descent, under age 40, on the Western side of our service area with expertise in human resources or finance. Who do you know? Then it's like, oh, okay, that sounds like my neighbor, you know, somebody else within our network, rather than just who are you most comfortable with? Who do you like? Which tends to be what who do you know instantly translates until we give some parameters. So board composition matrix, get the right people on the bus and there's a tool to help you do it. Next. 
be sure there's a way for good, rather for bad board members to go away. We've all had it. Maybe they're not bad board members, but you know, the wallflowers, the ones just along for the ride that tend to not do anything. You know, Pareto's principle, the 80-20 rules in full effect, 80, 20% of our board doing 80% of the work. So let's just not be stuck with these people forever. Um, and you probably know where I'm going here. Yes, term limits. If you don't have them, please work towards that. It's a long process. You know, you have to build that coalition, that majority, whatever it says in your bylaws, um, to get them voted and get them put in. But it's a long process, but it's worth it for healthy organizations. We don't need 20 year board members. Um, and that's how we get into groupthink and all these other problems that we run into. Uh, what's my favorite? I really love three year terms, um, renewable once. And after that point, you have to get off for at least a year. Um, that seems to work well. You really get their expertise and good things, but we have an opportunity for other people to come on. There's lots of good systems, you know, board source, other places will tell you um, ideal best practices on term limits. Um, my tool for you here, I have a tool for almost each of these things. Um, it's a real simple one. It's just simply a planning tool. So I always had three year terms and I just had this simple table where I'd have my board members. I had placeholders for things and I could just kind of see and track, you know, when are my vacancies gonna come up and update it once a year and could just kind of see that and are my classes balanced. It was just kind of a good um, management tool to help, but simple word file with a, with a table in there, nothing too fancy. But if you don't have those term limits, work towards it. That's how we get those bad ones off. All right, now we're ready to address our clarity, knowledge, and motivation. Let's start with clarity. Set clear expectations from the start from the start, and I'm gonna say even before the start. So what am I talking about here? Clear expectations. I wanna be as specific as possible with what your role is when it comes to fundraising. Okay, so now I throw it back to staff. Do we know what they're really supposed to be doing in regards to fundraising? Because if we're not clear, they're certainly not gonna be clear. So what is the board's role when it comes to fundraising? Well, here we go. I put it in five buckets. Donor, a donor of treasure, not just time and talent. Um, I, you know, I don't like minimums. I like personally significant. Um, it's a line that allows everybody to interpret that. Um, it ensures equity, all kinds of other things. Um, I can't get into it today, but there's also been some IRS determinations that setting a minimum for board participation may mean that that's not a deductible um, contribution. So something to look out for there. So personally significant, I like that. Um, we always talk about how, you know, if we can't check the box on the grant application that we have 100% board participation, then, you know, we're probably not gonna get that grant, all of that. But for me, it's more, how can we go out to our community asking for support if we don't have that internal buy-in as well? So donor, next up, visionary leader. Yes, they are a visionary leader in regards to the whole organization through strategic planning, other pieces, but also when it comes to fundraising. And that means making fundraising a priority. You know, it's not just that afterthought, that thing we have to do, um, it's the fundraising goal. It's not just the difference between all the other revenue streams and what we want to spend. It is realistic. It has modest growth and we support it. There is capacity. There is funding. It takes money to raise money and it's not going to just magically appear. So we make sure it is prioritized and that is there. Next is risk mitigator. A lot of people forget about this one, but fundraising is a little risky especially when we get into weird assets. So what if someone wants to donate a house, um, a horse, cryptocurrency? Um, it happens. 40% of all crypto donors owners have made a crypto donation of $1,000 or more. Um, it was a little more prevalent a few years ago, but do we are we even comfortable with that? You know, if we're an environmental organization, maybe we aren't. Have we had this conversation? Do we have policies in place, like a gift acceptance policy, so that we don't have to say no and you know turn away a donor? We can just make the policy be the bad cop. The role of the board member is simply to ask the what if questions 
and the do we have questions like have we properly registered with the IRS and our state to be able to solicit funds? These kind of questions. Just making sure those questions pop up. The last two are the ones they're kind of familiar with. Ambassador, going out from the organization to talk, to raise awareness, to ask for support in their personal and business networks. And supporter, supporting kind of the internal fundraising function. So serving on an events committee. Uh, maybe running around town to help staff pick up auction items, you know, whatever it is where we need those extra helping hands in our small lean fundraising shops. So those are the roles. Um, when do they find out about this? Before they come on the board, right? Not once they get there, it's before. And the tool I always use here is a board job description. And I will use the word job, J-O-B, because I don't, I don't like volunteer role description. You know, I want them to take it super serious. It is a job. You're not paid for it, but it's a job. Um, and in this job description, I am super specific. So here is my sample one that I have for you on my resources page. Um, and I even get more specific than this one now. Um, but I'll have things on there like, make your personally significant donation during the first month of the fiscal year each year. Um, make at least three introductions to new potential donors or sponsors each year. Um, secure, buy, or secure a table for the annual gala. You know, whatever it is, very specific. And then this document is shared with them before they come on the board. Uh, my process when I was a nonprofit executive director was I'd have a member of my governance committee with me. We'd meet for coffee or lunch. Um, spend the first half of our time just kind of feeling them out, their interests, their passion, their availability, all those kind of things. And then if it seemed right, I would slide that document across the table, um, ask them to take it with them and review it. And then I'd give them a call a week later. And I would kind of go line by line, especially highlighting the key things. There is no way you could come on that board and not know the expectations. So if you were not doing it, then it was clearly you just were there for the wrong reason. And then we had a way to take care of that. So um, board job description, share it ahead of time. Next up, help them tell the organization's story. This is where they struggle a little bit, um, kind of on that knowledge piece. So they, you know, they understand what we do, but they're at an event, you know, maybe they're at a chamber function or something. And someone says, you know, I saw you went on the board of ABC nonprofit. What do you guys do? And they go, well, um, you know, we, we help kids that need this. They just stumble all over it. And some of them think like they should try to use our mission statement. Um, I don't know if you've looked at your mission statement lately, but they tend to be a lot like this. Um, this was a slide I snapped at a fundraising conference probably over a decade ago now from uh, the great nonprofit copywriter, Tom Ahern. And um, yeah, they're just jargon filled, congratulatory, long, they're usually the biggest run on sentence ever. Um, so I don't want them to recite our mission statement. Um, what I really want them to do is tell our story. Our mission's not our story, but let's give them a tool. So I like to give them the old elevator speech, right? but not the like 30 seconds about me elevator speech. I want a super simple elevator speech. And for me, that looks like this. We help who so they can do what? Let me tell you about someone. We help local kids so they can have a brighter future. Let me tell you about Jennifer. When Jennifer came to us, she was struggling with, you know, when we go into this story, they're not going to remember really what you do, or maybe even the organization's name, but they're going to remember that story. And that's all we need. They can remember the story, they can get back in touch. So the exercise I have for you is actually a worksheet. Um, I like to do this with a board. It takes like 10 minutes um, where they actually fill in the who and the do what. Okay. So they break them into groups of two or three, um, have them work together, fill in the who and the do what. We go around the room, we share, and we hear there's like five or six slightly different elevator speeches, and that's fine. And we encourage them to craft the one, you know, really hone it in on why you're here. What part of our programming do you really care about? You don't have to encompass the whole mission of the organization. And then we take a couple minutes and we share some really great stories. Got to always be feeding those stories to the board. 
And feeding stories to the board helps with that last problem, motivation. Because when they're hearing about the mission all the time and the change that is happening because of the work we're doing, that's motivating and that helps them do lots of other things. So that tool is a super simple elevator speech worksheet. Uh, do I have an example on the, oh, here it is. Just you know, simple like there, there's a space for them to write. We give them some examples. Um, you know, we, we it's, it's there. We just uh, who and do what? Easy little activity also can help with a little bit of board bonding, especially if you have some new folks in there. I kind of call this not really the elevator speech anymore, but more, I call it the cheese tray speech because you're more likely to use this like you're at a function, you got a name tag on and you're reaching for the last piece of pepper jack and someone says, oh, I see you're with ABC nonprofit. What do you guys do? Um, and then having this, well, we help local kids so they can have a brighter tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you have a minute, I'll tell you the story about Jennifer and kind of go into it from there. All right, so get them comfortable talking. And I just touched on this. You know, we bring the mission to life for them. Yes, we can do that through stories. Um, that's one of our many tools. I'd like to infuse story in everything, every um, you know, piece of communication. Um, it's always story first. Stories, uh, you know, statistics tell, but stories sell is the slogan that we often use. So stories are infused, but I also like to do it with a board through mission moments. Mission moments. This is putting the mission first and foremost in our board meetings. So um, I had really dry, I was a nonprofit ED for 10 years. I had really dry board meetings at first. Um, they were eight in the morning, um, almost an entirely corporate board. Everybody just wanted to get in, get business done and get out of there. And uh, we'd get into kind of petty little quabbles over things like the formatting of the financial statements and, and other things until I infused mission moments. And our mission moments were simple. Um, this was a United Arts Fund. So we raised money for about uh, 30 different arts and cultural organizations in our region. And um, so instead of just talking about that, I actually had them come in. I had a beneficiary come in at the start of each board meeting and for five minutes, talk about what the funding we provided allowed them to do that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And for a lot of them, it was focusing on things like educational outreach programs, you know, additional uh, intensives and kind of behind the scene things that we, you know, I knew happened, but the board just really didn't see. And uh, it just changed the whole dynamic around the meeting. It went from, you know, I wanna talk about this problem. I don't like these financials, what's going on here to, wow, that was amazing. I didn't know we actually did that. Um, that's really cool. How do we like raise more money so we can do more of that? Um, but the mission moment just changed the whole dynamic of the meeting to a much more uplifting and reminding people why we're really here. So even if you can't have beneficiaries or something like that come in, uh, clients, individuals, whatever you call the people or the, the items you serve, um, you know, at least telling a start, starting with a story, reminding us why we're here. Because most board meetings happen in, you know, sterile rooms away from the mission if they're even on site. So we got to infuse that back into there. Number six, tell them what you need them to do monthly. Uh, this is my favorite tip for today, because um, this was the one that really got my board to actually do stuff. Um, I had set up, you know, other things. The structure was already there. Um, so maybe this isn't your first one, but when you feel like the structure and the expectations and the roles are set, it might be time to activate this one. So um, I had this situation that I did a monthly board report. Um, and this works whether you're an executive director, director of development, whatever, if you have a report to the board, um, that was my tool, right? I'm like, I just, yeah, two pages, PDF, bullets. It wasn't that hard to get through. But I got the sense that they didn't really read it because we show up at the board meeting and all the questions I'd get were things in the report. So one month I decided to do a test. Um, I don't recommend doing this like if you're in the first six months of your position, but I was like three years in, so I was a little comfortable. I'd proven myself. So 
So I did a test, I sent out my board report and on the top of page two of the board report, it said, if you are reading this, please send me an email that's blank and just says, hi, Chad, in the subject line. So I had 18 board members, throw it in the chat. How many hi, Chad emails do you think I received? How many hi, Chad? There's two, three, 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 one, one, one. There it was, there was the zero. Yes, unfortunately it was a zero. Um, I had the best board chair of my life at the time. I think she normally read it. It was just a bad month, um, but yeah. Okay, so I'm spending like two hours a month writing this report that isn't getting read. This is pointless. And I wish I were, no, remember where I stumbled upon it so I could give them credit because they changed my nonprofit and now I've implemented this and, and folks have put it so many other places Fabulous tool. Here it is. This is my board update grid. Board update grid. So what this was, it's exactly how you see it. Um, I kept it in Google Sheets and this, it's just these sheets. And every month I filled in these 12 boxes. So three recent organizational accomplishments. What happened last month? You know, three current staff priorities. What we're working on this month and the key row what I need you to do. Current staff needs, areas for board assistance. Um, and within there, I would hyperlink things. Like make your annual contribution was hyperlinked to the online giving form. Um, sign or return your annual conflict of, in of interest disclosure statement was linked right to the form. And then um, it started as just a three by three and I made it a, a three by four um, because I had this massive list of like names in the database with no giving history and I had no clue who they were or why they were there. So I just started randomly putting three of them in there. And I'd get replies like, oh, um, you know, ABC Bank, they're our bank. Let me see who handles the account and I'll see if we can get a lunch set up. That would have been great forever ago, but they needed that prompt. This worked so well. You know, I'd send this out, you know, by the end of the day, I'd have five online contributions and, and various statements. Um, you know, they just knew exactly what they needed to do. They were in the loop. Before a board meeting, I still did a full report. Um, so my board meetings were quarterly, so this helped. But you know, this this little piece, even if you still have to do a monthly board meeting, a board report, I'd encourage you to kind of do this as a pull out that goes with it. What do you really need? This works so well that um, about two years into doing it, I took a two week vacation, and that's pretty rare for me. I was a big anniversary with my wife. We did a big trip. And uh, it fell over the time that I would always send this. I always send it, I send it on the 18th of the month. It was just an arbitrary day, but they came to expect that. And when I came back, I had five emails from board members saying, I didn't get my board update grid. I wanna make sure I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. So they are trainable. They wanna help. We just gotta break it down because we are not their primary job. They got a million other things to do. We gotta simplify it. And this tool really helped. So maybe it's not exactly this, tweak it, make it yours, but literally fill out the grid, copy and paste. And that's all they got. Subject line, board update grid for January. Open it, all it is is this grid. No commentary, nothing. It's just super simple and it worked really well. Number seven, of course, the guy that does board training is gonna tell you to invest in board training. Um, yes, I am, but uh, I'll give you a way to do it for free too. Um, it's that knowledge piece. We just make so many assumptions. We assume that because they're professionals, they know how to do this. A lot of them, even our salespeople, there's still some fear, like they don't understand the mechanics or you know, maybe they're gonna be too harsh with it. There's a kind of a softer side. So making sure they have the tools they need and you cannot do it. That is my rule. You cannot train your board. Um, it's just the thing, you can say it, as much as you want. If you're an insider, they're used to you. You need that outside expert theory to come in and give them something. So I like to, um, a lot of times, you know, if there's like a sister organization, maybe you're in a state or national network and there's another like well-respected organization a couple hour, an hour or two from you, having them come in, talk about what they did, how they work with their board, that can be effective. Um, you can even just trade boards with a peer. Um, I train your board, you train my board. Here, this is the slide deck I want you to present, like give them exactly what, but it will be so much more effective 
coming from something else. They just tend to listen that way. The other way to make it effective is to actually ask them what they want. What aren't you comfortable with? Where do you feel like you need some additional training? So a board self-assessment, something like this one that's in the resource page. Just a simple rating from one to five. Um, I get the mission. I understand our services and initiatives. Um, I, I recommend individuals for service. Just kind of goes through. It shows us where the gaps are. And when we find a gap, that's a potential area for some training. If they've actually identified training areas, they're far more likely to come and attend and engage with that training. All right, so let's get them some training. Don't have to pay for it, but there are fabulous trainers out there. Um, I recommend you know, doing some kind of passive training, maybe at least twice a year, where maybe we're gonna watch a video or read an article ahead of the board meeting and then come in and discuss it for five, 10 minutes as part of our meeting. And then actually doing some kind of intensive 90 minute training or retreat, you know, maybe at least every two years to really do that. Number eight, this is another great one. Find out what fundraising tasks they are actually willing to do, right? Because we don't need everyone to do everything, right? I don't need everybody to be a frontline solicitor, you know, recruiting sponsors. I need some to, to do that. I also don't need everybody um, making thank you calls. I mean, it, it would help, but you know, I just need some doing each thing. And we, our board members all have different comfort levels. Some are fine with fundraising. Some, oh, I, the, I'll do anything to help our cause, but please don't ask me to fundraise. So we need to find something for those people as well. And um, you know, they just have this fear. So the tool here is a menu, a board fundraising menu, okay? So I'm gonna take all the ways you can help with fundraising at our organization, and I'm gonna put them in one big list something like this. And um, I'm just gonna ask you to check off what you're comfortable doing. And that first one there, make a personally significant contribution. I always have that pre-checked. Uh, I can't avoid that one. Um, another exercise I love to do at a board meeting. Um, this really helps if someone well-respected, someone non-staff, so maybe your past board chair, your longest serving board member kind of introduces this and says, you know, per, per our board job description, uh, we all need to assist with fundraising. We recognize everyone has a different comfort level. So we're gonna do this activity. We're gonna ask you what you're comfortable with. And then staff will engage you when it's time to do that item. And we'll kind of move forward. We don't all have to do everything, but we all have to do something to push fundraising forward at this organization. So I have this sample for you on the resources page. Um, grab it. There's lots of great examples. Also get rid of what doesn't work, what doesn't apply for your organization, add in things that do and try it. Um, my favorite way to do this was I'd have the board member kind of introduce it and I'll do this at, at board training sessions. And then I put the executive director or maybe the development director by the door. And that piece of paper is their ticket out of the room. Um, as they're leaving, we kind of collect them. Do not let them leave with the menu. You will never get them back. You know, just have them do it there as part of the process. And then for staff, um, you kind of take all those surveys and you just compile it. So, you know, I had like a master document that said, thank you calls. And it had like the five people willing to do it. Um, auction item solicitation. And there was, so when I got to the time in the fundraising calendar, it was time to begin that. My first step was reaching out Hey, thanks again for back when we did our board fundraising menu for the year. You said you'd be willing to assist. It's time to get rolling with that. Um, you know, here's how our, our process is going to be for this year. You don't have to ask for volunteers and get the radio silence emails because you've already asked for them. So board fundraising menu, another great tool. Oh, and here's, here's board fundraising menu uh, 201. So that was 101. Here's 201. Here's an example of how someone applied it. Um, this is Jennifer Hitz with Leg Up Farm in York, Pennsylvania. She says, I was in a training of yours a few years back and had my first exposure to your board fundraising menu. Each board member, uh, we took it, we took this, personalized it, and kick off each year with the board governance chair sending it out to each board member and then follow up with a deadline at the first board meeting of the year. So that can work, but I still like to do it in person. It's been phenomenal. Gets members to think of ways they can contribute that they may not have even thought about. 
Each year we fine tune it and even have a section at the top for general expectations, which reiterates some of the things in their job description, but also give them a couple of easy ways to support our organization that are minimal and non-intimidating, i.e. add your board service to your LinkedIn profile, provide an auction basket. As the lead development staff, I then schedule a coffee or lunch meeting with every single board member in preferably the first three to four months of the year. We review their commitments, but also talk bigger picture. What do you like about our board? Where could we improve? What have you seen other organizations do that is really effective that we don't? I also always close with asking if they didn't consider including us in their estate plans. I ask this casually, but pointedly, because each member is at a different stage in life. If one has really little kids that can only see daycare, mortgage bills, and college in their future, no big deal. It's a seed that's been planted. I usually get a quarter of them saying yes, and the others saying that they'd like to do so when they know their kids are in a good place. Something I can always follow up on in a few, in a few years. So for me, the fundraising menu is a conversation starter. Once the conversation is started, how far it goes is up to us. So that's taking this simple tool, using it as a way to engage with each board member, we already know exactly how they want to engage, just, just kind of boost that comfort. And look, we even managed to squeeze in a legacy giving conversation in there at a non-confrontational time. So um, really like how Jennifer applied that tool. Okay, number nine, we're getting to wrap up and then we're gonna have time for your questions. I see some of them in there. I haven't gotten to all of them. We'll try to do that. Um, start them with stewardship. So no matter what, you're still going to have those fundraising averse people. Um, we're gonna get them to check off a couple things on the menu, but the easiest one for them is to start them with stewardship. So the board fundraising calls are incredibly valuable. Um, if you're not doing them, I highly recommend it. If you have a board that is resistant, here is the tool to get them to do them. This is research-based. Um, this comes out of, here we go. Right here, this old book, Donor-Centered Fundraising, uh, research by Penelope Burke and Cygnus Research about a little over 20 years ago, and then repeated, revalidated um, during the pandemic. Uh, this is the first edition. The, uh, yeah, the second is red and blue, I believe. Um, but great book, lots of good examples, highly recommend it. Um, but research study, 40,000 households across the US and Canada looking at what do donors want to keep giving? And one of the things they found, that is if you make a prompt personal thank you call from a board member to a donor, they tend to give 39% more than the control group. I would like to get 39% more from the donors. So um, share that, that tends to get our resistant board members to at least try making calls. Um, the other resistance we get is, you know, I could do that, but I wouldn't know what to say. Give them a script, you know, tweak it for your organization. Uh, I have my script for you in the resources page. Um, mine's a little playful. Um, I have these two pauses built into it. And when the person pauses, the donor thinks that they're about to ask them for a bigger gift. Um, so, you know, uh, hi, uh, hi, Ryan, this is Chad with ABC Nonprofit. Calling today to thank you for your recent donation. It means so much. And we wanted to tell you personally how grateful we are. They're now expecting me to say, and we wanted to see if you'd be interested in joining our monthly giving society to support our mission on, you know, they're ready for the upsell. So when I just pause and don't say anything, they tend to say, oh, well, well, well thank you. So they thank us for thanking them. And we kind of go on to have this nice little connection and conversation. Um, these calls are fabulous. Once board members start them, they usually get um, really to like them. Um, yes, voicemails are fine too. It's pretty much the same content. Um, still effective. Um, I have a board member, um, I guess this occurred probably about 15 years ago now. We were doing board thank you calls and she was hesitant, but on about her third call, she connected with someone um, in her community. You know, they were pretty similar. They supported the organization for the same reason. They had like this, I think she said it was a 45 minute conversation. You know, these are usually like three minute calls. And um, they actually set up a meeting for lunch later. Um, and that friendship grew to the point that they have now gone on vacation to Europe for two weeks every summer for the last 12 years. Um, and it started as a board thank you call. 
So uh, these can be enjoyable for board members. We just got to get them to do a couple till they have that one really good one and then they are hooked. Um, I always get the question, who should you call? Um, and sometimes in a full presentation, I put up a Ghostbusters slide right then, but um, you know, it really doesn't matter to me. Um, everybody wants to call like your $500 plus donors. And I get that. The issue is that that's who everybody calls. So they're not, you know, might not have as much power. So I like looking at more behavior than dollar amounts. So maybe um, first time donors, they're not used to getting a call. Um, maybe someone who's made a contribution 10 years in a row, thanking for longevity. Maybe monthly donors on the um, anniversary date of their, of their giving, just to thank them for that support. So thinking outside of the box a little bit, and uh, you know, I'm fine if you want to call fifty hundred dollar donors. That might have even more impact because who knows what their capacity is, and I guarantee you, nobody else in town is calling them if that's their normal average level. So just think a little creative there. Um, it doesn't hurt. Just get them calling. This also deepens the board members' engagement and motivation when they're hearing and telling stories and having conversations with folks that care about the mission just like they do. Number ten. I don't know about you, but I've had a few painful experiences in my career where we tried to do a prospect identification exercise. So we want board members to give us names. You know, who do you know? And I pass out this blank sheet of paper and I ask them to write three names of anyone in your personal or business network that doesn't currently support our organization that you think may be interested. And I give them 10 minutes and look at the papers and what do they look like? Yes, I advanced the slide. They are blank. They are blank, right? Because we didn't paint the picture before asking for names. So what I really need to do is to both paint the picture and to make them comfortable. So paint the picture. I'm gonna be more effective if I say, you know, a typical donor to our organization is in their 50s or 60s. Um, they have an interest in education and literature. Many of them are former teachers um, or university professors, and they tend to have very um, home-based hobbies and tend to be a little introverted. All right. So it's just, you know, it doesn't have to explain all your donors, but maybe a critical mass. Then it's like, oh, okay, that kind of sounds like my neighbor. You're, he's, they are still not going to write the neighbor's name. And we're going to get to that in a minute. Um, I also like to give them some prompts. Um, these prompts come out of a fabulous packet that is on the resources page called How to Grow Your Army of the Engaged, um, put together by the great uh, nonprofit management and leadership group guru, Joan Gary. Uh, if you don't follow her, I highly recommend that. She has a great podcast, other tools, but it's a seven page packet of these questions with blanks underneath them. Questions like, who are the last five people you've gone out to dinner with? Who do you send holiday cards to? Who do you exercise with? Whose Facebook birthday fundraisers have you supported? And where do you go to have blank done? Uh, car, nails, hair, dog, you know, all those local service providers, right? So just things to get their mind going because the, the instant response is, oh, I don't know anybody. And they know people, we just have to remind them of who they know. But they're still not gonna write names down because you haven't told them what you're gonna do with the names. And they go to worst case scenario. They go to this. Hey there, is this Joe? Hi Joe, this is Chad with ABC Nonprofit. Um, our board member, Karen, yesterday during a prospect identification exercise, wrote down your name as someone capable of giving us a $500 donation. May I please have your credit card number, right? That, that's what they just envision happening. And no, it would never happen, but you also didn't tell them what is going to happen. So I like to just kind of paint that picture. Um, one of my favorite things to always do was just to invite them to something. So these names, we're gonna take them, we're gonna invite them to a business networking reception, maybe five to seven on a weeknight, a little wine and cheese, if we can do that. And in the middle, we're gonna talk about what the organization does for 10 minutes and then no ask. And then afterwards, we're gonna follow up to see if they're interested in learning more, in which case we would do one-on-one -on -one meetings. Right? That's simple. Uh, and really what I'd love you to do is you actually bring these people with you when you attend. 
So some kind of, you know, I've seen like muffins in the morning, you know, various things, little open houses, some kind of putting your organization out there, a way to get to know us that's non-threatening without an ask. Then you get names. You painted the picture and you told them what was going to happen next. Um, another interesting thing, when you ask a major donor, what is their favorite way to learn about new causes they could support? They all overwhelmingly say, in a small intimate event in the home of someone I trust. Home of someone I trust. So little dinner party with like five couples, uh, a, a outdoor barbecue in the summer, something like that, that can be the same thing. So encouraging board members to host small socials, um, nice way to do it. Again, you're just there, you talk for five, 10 minutes about it. Maybe you have a little bit of literature and you follow up with people afterwards to see if they're interested. Small socials. Uh, this comes from Gail Perry, another fabulous uh, fundraising consultant and expert. She's from the South in North Carolina. She calls them porch parties. But uh, up North here, our porches are not usable year round. So I prefer small socials. Number 11, getting ready to wrap it up here. Find an accountability partner on your board. All of this stuff is great. All of it works, but only if there's accountability. Only if there's someone on your board that is gonna back you up and really push this forward and encourage and, and really follow up with people to make sure this stuff actually happens. So who's a good uh, accountability partner? These are who I like. I like development committee chair, if you have a good one, because technically it's their job, but we don't all have good ones. Um, immediate past board chair works really well. Like everybody knows them. They have some rapport with folks. Governance committee chair can also work. Um, and sometimes longest serving board member, just the person that's respected. And they're just gonna say, you know, this is something we need to do for the organization. I wasn't completely comfortable when I first started doing it, but it's made a huge impact. We need to all step forward. And they ask questions like, what are you personally willing to do to assist the organization with fundraising? Um, and we kind of address this through that board fundraising menu, but just making sure that they should be the one introducing this. We're doing this because we all need to take uh, accountability for this. Uh, what I've seen some boards do that I really love is ask, what are we as a board willing to do to assist the organization with fundraising? Um, and some have taken on goals like, we're gonna raise $50,000 in new revenue this year. We're gonna let staff focus on retaining our current and doing normal acquisition channels, events, all of that. And we're gonna focus on new money because if we were able to raise 50,000 new revenue, you know, that's almost enough for a position. We can add additional fundraising capacity. We could launch that new program we wanna do, finally replace the HVAC, you know, whatever it is. Um, some kind of special project there, taking some accountability. And then finally, what happens when someone doesn't do it? How are we gonna hold each other accountable? Well, if I know I'm gonna get a call from Keeley when I don't make my board fundraising calls, I'm gonna be more likely to make my calls. Um, and that call is not, um, hey, Chad, why didn't you make your calls? Everybody else did it. You're the only one that didn't get, no. It's, hey, Chad, um, I was talking to staff and um, I, I heard that they hadn't heard about your calls for the last two months. Is there anything I can do to help you with those? That's the question. Is there anything I can do to help you with those? Um, that not, a, not an accusatory, it's just there. They'll reply, oh, I've just been busy. I'll take care of that for you tomorrow. But if no, one, no one's gonna call and nothing's gonna happen and I'm not motivated, probably not gonna get done. Number 12, finally, don't fester, right? Do what I just did. So, so often, you know, our board's not engaged. We send out an email, we get no replies. We're just sitting at our desk saying, oh, why, why? I need more help. I need them to do things. I need to not have to email them three times. And instead of doing that, just pick up the phone, right? I love to just pick up the phone, give them a call and do that same thing I just said, you know? Hey, what can I do to help you with this project, with this task? That question is really powerful for getting people to move to action. So don't waste that time sitting there festering, just engage with them, keep trying different channels, go from email to phone, 
to showing up at their favorite coffee shop in the morning where you know they stop every time and happen to being in line at the same time, you know, whatever it takes, but let's engage these board members and go from there. Pick up the phone, give them a call. Those are my ways to address clarity, knowledge, and motivation, which are our three big barriers to a board that is engaged and excited to participate in that fundraising process. Uh, I'm gonna wrap through a couple additional resources for you, excuse me, and then I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, I always love to give a book recommendation. Um, I work with a lot of libraries, so um, they've rubbed off on me, so I always do a, a book recommendation. Um, this is Transform Your Board into a Fundraising of Force, The Essentials You Need to Know by Kay Sprinkle Grace. Um, if you've had the pleasure of seeing Kay, um, she's been doing what I do for probably 40 years, and it's just a ball of energy and um, great presentation. This is a thin book, a quick read. Um, <laughs> No, I don't see it. Must have lent out my copy and it didn't come back, but I uh, need to replace uh, Transform Your Board on the on the, uh, the bookshelf. So that's linked up. Um, I go by Fundraiser Chad on all the social channels. I'm most active on Facebook and LinkedIn. So if you want to connect, I'm always sharing fundraising tips, um, upcoming webinars, lots of good stuff. Um, speaking of webinars, I do a free monthly webinar. Um, so this month, uh, next week, we are doing annual reports Simplifying the process for maximum donor engagement um, comes out of a story. I had a conversation with a donor about why she hates nonprofit annual reports and uh, took that information to, to make it something which is actually easier for us to do. So we're going to do things like get rid of the list of names, shorten it, move that letter from the executive director somewhere way deep, add and infuse stories, look at different ways, different formats. Um, that we can just freshen this up and let it be a much more engaging tool. So that is coming up. And uh, there's more information on how to engage or work with me on the resources page. And with that, I'm just gonna go to your questions. So uh, I'm gonna come to Big Chad here and uh, we'll pop in the chat. So if you have a question that uh, you're thinking of that you haven't already put in the chat, go ahead and type those in. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to scroll up to the top and see if I missed anything while you enter anything new. Um, lots of questions on where the resources, the link is in the chat several times. So just go over there and grab that. Um, okay. All right, we're liking the board composition matrix, great. Um, in human services or other fields, the voice of lived experience is critical. We have found that specific giving requirements, timing of gifts, by a table requirements do not support inclusive or possible policies to engage with board members of all backgrounds, socioeconomic experiences. Do you have any guidance on how to ensure the composition of board job descriptions are inclusive, but also supports giving? Yeah, um, I definitely run into this. I work with a few organizations that way. Um, some of them have kind of created tiers um, so maybe one tier is like direct personal support. Uh, one tier is like asking other people or maybe just spreading news or awareness or advocacy. So they kind of include things in there and they'll ask people um, to select at least two things from each category. Um, so there's a way that everybody can do that. So they're still in there, but they're not the only things in there. Um, and they kind of break it into themes a little bit. I know that's a little vague. Um, but yeah, definitely wanting to address that. Um, or, you know, they're on the master list, like I was, uh, and we just introduce it as stating, we understand that these are not all, not all of these items are appropriate for everyone. Um, our expectation is that maybe you'd be able to find five to 10 things on this list of 40 that you'd be comfortable doing or able to do. Um, so just kind of referencing that equity situation right from the beginning. So fabulous question. Should board members, uh, no, it's right over my wire. Should board members meet, be able to meet all the roles and fulfill all the tasks on the job description? For example, what if they're a visionary leader but not a financial donor? What if they attend uh, all events but never invite guests or help secure gifts? So yeah, I would just put your mission critical things on the job description. Uh, what do they all absolutely have to do? Um, and then you could even put on the job description um, you know, agree to um, complete five to 10 tasks off our board fundraising menu. And maybe we just attach that to the job description if you want to keep it more flexible 
um, and need to be able to, uh, to meet people where they're at there. Any tips for training or encouraging board members to invite people to events and become uh, community connectors? That's tough. I kind of go into introversion, extroversion. Um, I just like to give them tools. So I'll do things like actually draft an email. So like, here's an email that all you have to do is insert your name and maybe one little way you know the person. It's already there inviting them to this free event. So copy, paste, just do it. Um, so I simplify it. I also, if there's some social anxiety, I try to take that out there. Um, you know, giving them organizational note cards um, can help even with like a little script that way, but just giving them tools and repeatedly giving them the tools to kind of remind them. Um, but, you know, we're all at different comfort levels. It just takes time. Um, board members should have a skill set that meets your organization's board needs. Clear examples, we need a lawyer on the board, which is their primary contribution. And if they can help in other ways, great. Yeah, we all have different processes and needs. So we structure this around what our organization works, our bylaws and all of those. So um, not all of these tips will work for everyone. Uh, we're just structuring and going from there. So, oh, I had uh, had three of you with zeros. So uh, for my, my board member uh, replies to hi, Chad. Uh, what, what do you do when they bring value and refuse to fundraisers or give them that uh, refuse to fundraise or give themselves? It's our treasurer, which makes me crazy, but he's providing service by uh, balancing our books. So again, ideally they would do both or would do a minimum, you know, it does five things. Maybe it's not fundraising, but they're going to make some thank you calls. Um, you got to weigh the risks, um, you know. Or, you know, maybe we're grandfathered in there. Uh, we, we adopt a board fundraising menu, but it doesn't kick in there. So it, it's got to be flexible and do what you need to do for your organization. Recommendation on best way to remove a board committee member if they are not fulfilling the role. We do have the authority to do this in our bylaws, but you have recommendations for the actual conversation. That conversation needs to be put on by the board chair, um, not you. Um, I recommend it being a one-off, a phone call, uh, a meeting, um, and again, approaching that as, you know, what's going on? Um, you know, you used to be an engaged board member or we haven't seen you in a while. Is this still the right fit for you? Um, you know, in the best interest of the organization, I have to have this conversation because you're taking up a valuable seat on our board and we want to ensure that someone is there that can really give. Um, do you need to step away now? And maybe in a few years, we can look at you coming back on board when life slows down, just this real empathetic conversation. Um, that is my key, you know, leading with empathy, leading with, I want to help you, but we need to both act in the best service of the board would be my best recommendation there. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, regarding motivation, what incentives do you feel board members have to be dedicated, hardworking member of the board, volunteering countless hours of the time, aside from believing in the organization and the mission? Um, yeah, I mean, definitely the mission's there. We, we got to have that. Uh, we won't be able to motivate them whatsoever if they don't really care about the mission. Sometimes we get those folks that are just like filling a corporate seat and that tends to never really work out well. Um, but other motivation, you know, people, it's that sense of belonging, um, belonging to something bigger than myself that's moving forward. We kind of discount that. And, uh, you know, especially our, our corporate folks and they, you know, have a hard time finding that sometimes. So, so a place where they can belong with other like-minded people. Um, sometimes like the chit chat before and after the board meeting is the most important thing to folks. Um, you know, maybe they have some loneliness in their life, you know, that could be it. Or maybe um, it's the only time of the month that they're not like surrounded by screaming children or something like that. It can be an escape. You know, there's lots of social value that boards provide as well that we tend to kind of discount alongside serving an important cause in our community. So, all right, that was your question list. So I'm gonna toss it back over to Ryan to wrap us up. Thank you all. All right, it's time for the session to come to an end. A big thank you to Chad for sharing his expertise with us. Don't forget Elevate 2024 is right around the corner, kicking off on February 27th. The discounted early bird rate expires on February 1st. So please don't forget that. Make sure you register today. A link in the chat will be given to you <clears throat> of what kind of sessions you can expect. We hope to see you there very soon. Keely will also post that in the very bottom. With that, thank you for your time today. And we hope to see you soon. Take care, everyone.
Thank you.